Welcome to our Compass Seminar on this Wednesday afternoon. We have a special invited speaker today, Annalena Deppenmeyer in Colorado. And she was invited by Kathy Gunn a, a while ago, who at that time was here at Rasmus. But she moved in the meantime to Tasmania, where it's, where it's now seven in the morning. But she agreed to introduce the speaker from there. So we will now switch to Kathy in Tasmania. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, or good morning in my case. So I'd like to welcome Anna, my friend, uh, to the Compass Seminar today. So broadly, she, in her scientific career, she's been thinking about air-sea interaction in the tropics. And she completed her PhD in the Netherlands, where she investigated air-sea interaction in the tropical Atlantic. Uh, since 2009, she's been working on her postdoc in NCAR, which is in Boulder in Colorado. 19, and she's now... I will say, 2019. Did I <laughs> say 2000? The... What did yeah. I say? 2009. Oh, she's not that old. 2019. <laughs> um, and she's now looking at the tropical Pacific. So specifically, she's thinking about cross isothermal velocities in the Pacific cold tongue. And that's what she's going to be discussing today. Um, she uses output from a really high resolution model to look at those cross isothermal velocities. And this work has recently been accepted in JPO, if you want to find out more. And of course, you can ask her questions at the end of the talk. And then for future directions in the summer, um, she started, she's going to start working on a NASA grant, which she was awarded. And that's looking at water mass transformations in ocean state estimates. Um, so thank you, Anna. Please take the floor. Thanks, Kathy. Um, let me know when you can see this slide. We can see the slides now. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy, for introducing me. And thanks for coming to my seminar. Um, so I thought we'd start by looking at a somewhat fun animation. This is what I, as an oceanographer, think is fun. Um, this is the sea surface temperature in the tropical Pacific. So we're looking at 15 south to 15 north. Um, here we have South America on the, on the right hand side, and then it's extending all the way up to 100, 160 east um, on the west and the left hand side. And what you can see here is, um, yeah, I want you to get a feeling of the tropical Pacific um, and what I'm going to look at. And so the main thing to notice is that in the east on the right hand side, the temperatures are cooler, which is denoted by them being blue or lighter yellow. That's cool temperatures. And in the west, on the left hand side, we have this warm water, dark red, warm water that's some, sometimes like extending a little further to the east and sometimes retreating all the way out of the, sh out of the shot. And then, so that's that this predominantly cooler water in the east and warmer water in the west means that there's a zonal temperature gradient, um, which forces or enhances winds that go from east to west uh, and those coupled to the walker situation and we have all heard of variations interannual variations of this phenomenon um, as called el nino southern oscillation so basically the strength of the eastern equatorial cold tongue how cold it is sets the strength of the zonal temperature gradient which influences the walker circulation and the el nino southern oscillation but as you can see there's also so i didn't tell you that these are five daily snapshots of temperature just all uh, parsed after each other um, so you can also see that there's variability on shorter time scales for example what you just saw passing by here these filaments those are tropical instability waves they are transporting colder water or they, you can see them as colder water sort of expanding off the equator to the north and south and then traveling to the west. And this region is really important, first of all, because the LNU Southern Oscillation um, has global impacts, but also because um, there's a large amount of heat being taken up in these regions, especially when there's colder waters in the cold tongue. So the variation of this cold tongue is very important. And I just wanted to you to get a feeling of what the system looks like that we're we're going to be discussing. So I'll be talking about drivers of water mass transformation in the tropical Pacific and their variability. Uh, I did call it ENSO 
when I had to send the abstract and the title, but I added a couple of other timescales in the end. So I changed it to just the variability. And this work has been done at NCAR with Frank Bryan, uh, with Billy Kessler at NOAA PMEL and with Luann Thompson at the University of Washington. So I have this little sketch for you, which is my very simplified schematic of the tropical Pacific circulation that we need to understand, or at least, you know, get some intuition about before we can start diving into the water mass transformation aspect. But before we do that, I wanted to give you a little bit of a roadmap to my talk. So I'm going to explain what water mass transformation is because it sounds like a long word and I'm very likely to stumble <laughs> over it in the course of this presentation. Um, so we'll talk about what that is. Then we'll talk about what enables water mass transformation in the tropical Pacific. And um, we will investigate whether there's a modulation. Is it always the same? Is it sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker? And then we're going to have a brief look at other timescales than interannual. OK, so the equatorial Pacific. Before we get into relatively small scale details, I'd like to just introduce you or remind you all of the large scale structure um, of upwelling water mass and, uh, and that then leads to water mass transformation or ties in with water mass transformation. So we return to my little schematic. Um, I will orient you. So we're on the left-hand side here, we're on the west. Um, Right-hand side is the east. And then I tried to make a little 3D box. So this is a cross-section across the equator. The equator is this dashed line here. Um, so I have some grayer colors here that indicate colder water underneath the thermocline. The thermocline is here. And then we have the mixed layer here, which is shallower in the east and deeper in the west. And so the mixed layer is shallower and then because we get some heaping up of waters in the in the west, uh, which creates a pressure gradient, which drives the equatorial undercurrent. So we have one of the strongest currents on the planet, really, on uh, in the equatorial Pacific, which is the equatorial undercurrent or the EUC. And it's flowing roughly along the thermocline. So it's not it's not flowing completely straight, but has this upward slope. And then at the surface, oh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. At the surface, the winds are actually flowing from the east to the west. And they drive currents from the east to the west. So that's an opposing current in the, in the other direction. And so water moves on the equator, guided by the equator. And because of these surface winds and the Coriolis effect, we get divergence of the equator. So water masses are sort of being sucked out of the equator, um, which means that when we are um, reducing the water because it's divergent off the equator, we need to replenish it from below. And that is done by upwelling. So we usually draw these arrows and we say wherever there's divergence, there's also vertical motion from below to the surface, which is upwelling. And the thing where this gets really interesting is, so here you could just say, okay, water is moving up. It's in the mixed layer somewhat. Um, there's no real other physical mechanism required than the divergence. But here, when we look at the east, um, the way I drew this upwelling arrow, it's actually crossing the thermocline or an isotherm, a thermocline. The thermocline is just isotherms sitting really close to each other, right? So the water here has to cross isotherms. And that has to, there has to be a physical mechanism why that's happening. And that's what I will be looking at in this presentation. So we really, mostly worrying about where the upwelling is crossing isotherm, isotherms. And there is a little bit of an issue with this um, because we are having trouble quantifying the upwelling, let alone upwelling across isotherms, but the upwelling in total. So there's been uh, several studies, several observational studies in the past um, estimating W, so that's the Eulerian vertical velocity, um, I will say, I'll show you a couple of lines. They are slightly different locations, slightly different methods, but they are all trying to quantify upwelling in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. So this is one of the estimates that they get. And then another couple of authors get another estimate that, you know, the magnitude is not so wrong, but actually this estimate only goes to zero and doesn't become negative. And then there's another estimate that, um, also goes to zero and doesn't become negative. And if we now, this, these, the last um, estimate, the authors actually provided us with error bars. If we put the error bars on this estimate, then we can see that we really have very little confidence 
of whether this upwelling becomes negative, how big is it? I mean, this is a factor of two. So this, at this point, this really matters. And we're having a hard time estimating this. And this was only the total vertical velocity, right? Which sort of combines the, the cross isothermal velocity and, the, um, and other processes with which water move upwards. And, and also this is in the mean. So I drew three lines. I could probably draw a couple of others, but there's not an abundancy of these estimates because it's really hard. So we're estimating this from divergence. We're estimating how water moves up from meridional and zonal flows, which are relatively large numbers, and we get a very small number. So it's just really hard to estimate this. And then what we really want to do is, I mean, this speaks to how the tropical Pacific maintains its large scale structure. Um, because this complete vertical motion can also be decomposed into an adiabatic and a diabetic part. And I'm going to quickly explain. So if you think of this, these two lines are my thermocline. So it's basically two isotherms sitting close to each other. And this is the west and this is the east. So they are sort of sloping upwards. Um, so you ha can have one part of the vertical velocity is just flowing along these isotherms, which is what the EUC is doing. It's tilting upwards. And it's not strictly vertical, but it has a vertical component if you decompose this vector. But then you also have a component that's the right-hand side of my little schematic, which I've also drawn here just to remind us, where water actually crosses isotherms and where these diabetic processes, so diabetic means we have to put energy into, uh, into the system for this to happen, um, and where, where this happens. And it's, it's really hard because this total number is poorly constrained and it's hard to decompose into the two processes, and that's hard in the mean. And another thing that that's really interesting for, and also hard to do, but really interesting is how do these processes decompose when we're talking about variability? Like not only you know, keeping the mean the way it is, the mean circulation, but also how does this act on, for example, times scales of El Nino and La Nina? And there's, I put a couple of papers here where there's a mechanism, um, the research oscillator, which is basically hypothesizing that a lot of things have happened adiabatically. And then there's another paper, and there's a couple of other papers where they say that diabetic processes play a role. And so in this study, I would like to try to decompose this and I would like to diagnose this diabetic motion. So how does this tie in with water mass transformation? That big word. Um, so basically imagine, okay, first let me orient you. Here is to the left is the south, to the right is the north and the equator would be here. This is what the isotherms would look like across the equator. So they're sort of like curving upwards um, and then curving downwards. And here they're more parallel. Um, and I just picked this 20 degree isotherm as an example for us. So let's now imagine a water parcel sitting in between the 20 degree isotherm and the 20 degree minus a delta isotherm. So this water parcel here is a water mass. So a parcel with a mass. Um, and it has a specific class. And in this term, in this um, presentation, I'm going to refer to the class as the temperature. You could also refer to it as salinity classes or density classes. But in this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the temperature class. So if this ISO, if this parcel, sorry, again, I hit the wrong button. If this parcel now moves with a cross isothermal or diabetic velocity across this isotherm, it becomes a different class because it's changed its temperature from 20 degree minus delta to 20 degree plus delta. So this is a water mass transformation and this is the kind of water mass transformation I'm talking about. And what I'm diagnosing is the velocities with which that happens. So one distinct difference in this study compared to other studies is that usually what people do is they choose an isotherm, often the 20 degree isotherm, and then they follow it all the way up where it, where it outcrops. And then they integrate over this whole big mass of water bound by this isotherm. But what I'm interested in is the location of these processes, not only the time and what drives them, but also where do they happen. And I can do that by looking at these velocities in a local, in a local way. The one thing that we do have to remember when it comes to diabetic velocities is that they are, vert they are vertical when the isotherms are roughly horizontal because they will be projected into the 
direction of the temperature gradient. So they're vertical where the isotherms are horizontal. When the isotherm curves, such as happens here a little north or south of the equator, the direction of the cross isothermal velocity changes and we can't directly compare them to vertical little velocity or upwelling anymore. This will happen close to the surface where there's outcropping um, of isotherms. Okay, so now that we understand what water mass transformation is and the, the framework that I'm talking about it, I'm gonna take you to through my equations, bear with me. So I'm calculating the cross isothermal velocities, which indicate a water mass transformation, the velocity with which water mass transformation happens, as the projection of motion into the cross isothermal direction, which means that, so the motion is this little arrow here, and these are my isotherms, and I'm really concerned with them crossing isotherms, so they have to be normal to the, to the um, well, in the direction of the temperature gradient, normal to the isotherm. But what I also have to take into account is the movement of the isotherm itself. Because I can have this little arrow moving as fast as it wants. If the isotherm is moving with it, I'm still not really having any cross isothermal um, motion. So I need to make sure that I'm accounting for the movement of the isotherms. So that's how I calculate my total cross isothermal velocities. And then there's a clever way that you can read about in either this paper or my paper that should come out any minute now. Um, how we can connect this cross isothermal velocity to the heat budget. And that's nice because it allows us to decompose the total cross isothermal velocity into the physical processes that drive it. So we can not only say this is where cross isothermal velocity and diabetic processes happen, but this is why they happen. This is what enables them. So if I connect that to the heat budget, then I get a term that is the vertical divergence of solar penetration, I is my solar penetration. The vertical divergence of vertical mixing, this is the turbulent heat flux due to vertical mixing. And I get a component that relates to horizontal mixing. So these are all calculated from instantaneous fields, but I don't have instantaneous fields, I have five daily fields, so we need to take an average, which means that there arises an extra term that's a covariance term and we can call that the eddy term. It's an eddy term on sub five daily scales, I will say. There's also, there should be a plus higher order terms here that I left out because it's, the equation's getting too long, but it's also very small. So if I add up all my terms, I can recover these terms very well. And the reason I can do that is because I'm using a high resolution ocean model where thankfully I have the full heat budget output so I can close my heat budget. Um, I'm working with five day averages. This is a realistically forced um, ocean model. So JRA 55 DOE reanalysis is an interannually varying um, wind product that, or surface forcing product, I should say, not only wind. Uh, I have 60, 6, 36 years of this data at 10 kilometer horizontal resolution with at most five meter vertical resolution in the top. So this was the boring equation and model slide. So now let's have a look at some results and look at some figures. So I calculated my water mass transformation in the mean, my cross isothermal velocities, and I'm going to start looking at cross sections across the equator at 140 west, which is at a point where the cold tongue extends to, sometimes retreats. So this is interesting for, especially later on when we're looking at interannual variability, but I'll also show you some other locations for the mean. So what we can see here is that the cross isothermal velocity, so water mass transformation happens roughly between 20 to 25 degree uh, Celsius. And this reminds me that I should explain to you that the Y axis is in isotherms. So when I'm looking at cross isothermal velocities, I'm looking at isotherm space because in time, the isotherms move with depth. So if I plotted everything on depth space, I would sometimes be looking at the 20 degree isotherm and sometimes the 22 degree isotherm. But what I'm interested in is how much water, how fast water crosses this isotherm. So I'm mapping everything on isothermal space. That takes a little bit of getting used to, um, but it helps us to really isolate where the water mass transformation is happening. So we can see this sort of V shape, right? So there's an area here that where there's water mass transformation happening and you're gonna ask yourself why I put it so light, it's gonna become apparent in a couple of seconds. Um, and then 
from 25 degrees on, there's hardly any uh, water mass transformation happening anymore. And it's sort of splitting off the equator. And it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's in, a, in a latitudinal zone of two south to two north, two north where this is happening uh, in the ocean interior. And I can be sure that this is in the ocean interior because what I plotted here in this hatching is when the isotherm exists for less than 50%. So that means that we're close to the surface because the isotherm is moving in and out of existence. So south of two south and north of two north, we can still see some cross isothermal velocity happening, but now we're really close to the surface. And since we know that close to the surface, there will be isotherms outcropping, they're not horizontal anymore. So basically this motion here is more meridional rather than vertical, but here, where the isotherms are roughly, um, roughly horizontal, we are talking about a vertical motion. And so I can convince you maybe that the isotherms are roughly horizontal, but this plot where I do have the isotherms in gray, and these are corresponding to this gray sort of stipple lines up here. And you can see that down here, like we go into the 24 degree Celsius, which is this one, uh, that's roughly horizontal. And up there, we are really starting to curve. So the warmer we get, the more the water is going in a merge direction. And what I actually wanted to talk about in this uh, second figure is the colors, and that's um, the Eulerian vertical velocity, so the total W. So the total W is made up of this cross isothermal velocity and the long isothermal velocity. And you can see that the colors here are much brighter than in this one. And we can quantify that a little more if we look at a profile. Um, so now we're looking on the equator at 140 west, and this is the Eulerian, so the total vertical velocity in orange here. And here in blue, in the solid line, we have the process of velocity. So you can see that it is considerably smaller, this diabetic process, but it's still very present. It's not an order of magnitude smaller, it's a roughly a third of the Eulerian velocity. So that means that of this process, you know, where we have water crossing isotherms, it's a, it accounts for a third of the vertical velocity, which is not negligible. Okay, so but this is all nice and good for 140 west. So let's look at some more spatial structure of the cross isothermal velocity. Now I'm plotting maps on, on a given isotherm. So let me just go back and show you, like this is the 22 degree isotherm here, and this is the 20 degree isotherm. So what I'm doing is now I'm extracting sort of slices out here and I'm showing you a map so that we can see if this V shape and this structure is typical for, for the whole cold tongue or if it's only happening at 140 west. So I put the cross at 140 west and we can see that um, the picture looks fairly coherent. So basically in colder isotherms, um, the cross isothermal velocity is very closely located on the equator um, also at the 22 degree isotherm, which we still assume to be in the thermocline. But then when we move to 24, which is something that's getting closer to the surface, especially in the east, um, then we're moving the predominant cross isothermal velocities of the equator, which is likely an indication that we are now in this V-shape form. If we went even higher, there would probably be even more um, cross isothermal velocity here. And that would then be meridional velocities rather than vertical velocities. Okay, one other spatial plot just to have a look. Um, so now I've zoomed in before, I didn't tell you, but before we looked at seven south to seven north, now we're looking at three south to three north. So you can really see how closely uh, co-located this is with the equa equator. And now we can also point out some subtle differences. If we look at the, the very west of the cold tongue, so 155 west, uh, we're really not extending the water mass transformation deep into the thermocline anymore. We're really very shallow at warm waters. Um, but the further east we look, the colder the cross isothermal velocity happens or occurs. And also there is some interesting asymmetry here, which could be related to the cold tongue also being asy asymmetric. Okay, so now that we've got a good idea of what water mass transformation in the mean looks like in the tropical Pacific, closely, um, closely tied to the equator, um, and it's sort of coherent with the cold tongue. And now we can look at what enables the water mass transformation, because now that's when I get to use my heat budget. So this 
again is the total cross isothermal velocity at 140 west. And now I'm decomposing using my equation that I've showed you before, and I'm reminding you here into their different physical components. So this component is the vertical mixing induced components, depending on the divergence of the heat flux due to vertical mixing and the temperature gradient. And now we can see the picture sort of looks very different and very similar at the same time. So in the thermocline, it looks very similar, right? We can see this positive uh, cross isothermal velocity, which is directed upwards, by the way, I should say red is directed upwards. Um, that is very closely related to the sig signal that we see in the total. But there has to be something that's counteracting these downwards um, transform of water or against the uh, temperature gradient. And that in fact is the solar penetration, which is very closely tied to the surface. So again, it's here sitting in this area that's going in and out of existence in the isotherms and that transforms water from cold to warm. So it makes water move up. And in fact, if I now combine these two B and D plots and plot them to add them up, then I recover the total, um, the total signal of the cross isothermal velocity. And I will point out that this is not the same, <laughs> it's not the, th the same field, but this is calculated from these uh, projection of motion into the diathermal direction and, um, and the movement of the isotherms and C is really the sum of these two terms. So you can see that the vertical mixing and the solar penetrations are the dominant forces enabling water mass transformation in the tropical Pacific. And I already said that, but I also draw a little, drew a little cartoon. So how can we imagine this happening? So here we have our solar penetration. And the thing to remember is that the solar radiation is not all absorbed in the ocean model right here at the surface, but it decays with depth, but it still penetrates and can warm water parcels. So in this case, imagine this, this energy beam basically coming in and going below this isotherm, heating up this water parcel and enabling it to move up. And on the other hand, we have vertical mixing, mixing the warmer waters with the cold, which can, I should have put the parcel here, which enables this parcel also to move up. And close to the surface, this has the opposite effect. So these are the main drivers that enable water mass transformation in the mean, um, but I'm also interested in variability. So now we're going to have a look at how water mass transformation changes with ENSO cycles. So what I've plotted here is the Ninu 3.4 index of the model. It's a sea surface temperature anomaly uh, in a box of the Pacific. And I have shaded in red at times when I have detected an El Nino. And that means that it's warmer than 0 0.4 degrees Celsius in the anomaly and it exists for at least half a year. And I've done the same for La Nina, just in this case, it has to be colder than minus 0 0.4 degrees anomaly. And for the rest, of this ENSO part um, of the presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to average over all the red shaded periods and call them the, ENSO, the El Nino signal, average over all the blue periods, I'm going to call them the La Nina signal, and then all the white periods, which are the neutral phase. I'm going to take a sip before. Okay, so on the left again, we have the by now familiar time mean of cross isothermal velocity across 140 west. And now here is the decomposed signal into El Nino periods, neutral conditions, and La Nina periods. And what you can see, there's sort of a grad gradual increase of cross isothermal velocities um, from El Nino to La Nina. So because we're looking in isotherm space, there's a couple of things that we want to keep in mind, and that's during El Nino, the temperatures are warmer. So we're going to be occupying more of the warm isotherms. But we can see that the signal didn't only shrink in depth. It didn't only shrink in the amount of isotherms it occupies. It also really re reduced. So there's much less cross isothermal velocity, much less water mass transformation happening during El Nino than during neutral years. And during El Nino, La Nina, excuse me, is the opposite. Um, we are occupying colder isotherms in the isotherm space, which makes sense because our sea surface temperatures are colder. But we're also extending the range range of isotherms that we um, occupy, and we are um, strengthening our cross isothermal velocity. 
So now we can ask, okay, this is the total signal. What again enables or drives this total signal? And I again decompose the cross assembly velocity into the two components that I already have a hint might be important and that's vertical mixing. And again, we can see in the thermocline, there's this very strong correlation between the vertical mixing signal and the signal from the total cross assembly velocity and the solar penetration again, sort of cancels the negative um, water mass transformation velocities near the surface. So the same balance that water mass transformation is governed by vertical mixing and solar penetration holds during El Nino and La Nina conditions as in the mean. And I'm showing 140 west here, but it's the same if we go across to the east or the, I mean, if we go much further to the west, we have very little water mass transformation happening, but further to the east, it's the same. So this holds in the cold tongue is what I'm trying to say. And now, so we know that this, the vertical mixing driven component is important for water mass transformation in general and for the modulation of water mass transformation. And now we can go in the model and have a look at what is it, what is it that actually increases this vertical mixing driven component. And in order to do that, I'm going to switch from cross sections to profiles because it's going to be a lot of clots, I apologize, and it's easier to look at them in lines than in cross sections. So this is my first profile uh, and it just shows you exactly what we've just looked at just now on the equator and not across the equator. The red line is El Nino. The blue line is when we have La Nina conditions and the black line is when we have neutral conditions. So this is just the similar picture that we've seen before. In the isotherm space, we're deepening an isotherm space. Like remember, it's getting colder, so that makes sense. We're also increasing the cross isotherm velocity. And interestingly, during La Nina, we also have this extra bit of isotherm space that we're occupying. And there's a, quite a strong increase in cross isotherm velocity in this space, which we're interested in. So in order to get to the bottom of what drives this, um, I'm going to be plotting everything in depth space now, because that's easier to analyze for the model. So this is the exact same lines as I'm showing you here on the left in isotherm space, but in depth space, just so that you see the structure doesn't change. It's basically the same. Now we see less of the deepening, which again makes sense because um, this doesn't reflect where the isotherms are located in depth. But again, we see this really strong increase here and also in higher, higher, um, higher in the column. So I'll remind us of what this cross isothermal velocity driven by the vertical mixing component is made of. And that's one over the magnitude of the temperature gradient and the divergence of the turbulent heat flux. So if we now start by looking at the divergence of the turbulent heat flux, which is the dashed line here, we can see that in this area of interest and generally the divergence of the vertical heat flux is increased during La Nina compared to El Nino. And we can see that in the total heat flux too. So the ocean, there's, there's more heat being taken up, transported deeper into the ocean during La Nina than during El Nino. And this reflects in the divergence. So then we're asking ourselves, because you know we have model data, so we can go, really go down into the nitty gritty of this and we're, well, why not? So we're looking at the turbulent heat flux and what is that made of? And that in our model, uh, which, is, um, which uses parametrization, KPP parametrization for the vertical mixing, um, the heat flux is a diffusivity as estimated by a KPP times the vertical gradient of the temperature. And now we can say, okay, which of these two explain um, the increase in vertical mixing driven heat flux and water mass, water mass transformation with these different phases. Um, because, you know, we could imagine that the temperature gradient might change, or it could also be that the diffusivity changes. So we'll start looking at the temperature gradient. And in fact, the temperature gradient is not greatly changed. And most importantly, it's smaller during La Nina than during El Nino neutral conditions. So if you to multiply two numbers, right, and you have one that's smaller, it makes everything smaller. So this doesn't explain why we have enhanced vertical mixing driven water mass transformation. So it must be the diffusivity. And that is indeed the case. It's the diffusivity that has this very strongly increased in this area uh, where we're, that we're interested in. And that really drives this increase in vertical mixing driven cross isothermal velocity 
And again, we have model data, we can go and take this one step further. And we do take this one step further and have a look at, oh, okay, I circle this because this is the important part. Um, we do take this one step further and now we are interested in what actually makes the diffusivity increase. So in KPP and usually in mixing schemes, the diffusivity is dependent on or has a shear dependent component. It has a shear dependent component and a stability dependent component. Basically, strong vertical shear enhances, enables mixing. Um, so we're looking at V and U, the velocities, meridional and zonal velocities, in order to see if we can see any differences that would explain this increase in vertical mixing. V is kind of all over the place. U is a little more obvious. So um, we're getting we're getting a stronger, slightly deeper, not really deeper, but very, most importantly, stronger uh, equatorial undercurrent during La Nina. So that's already a hint. So then we can compare, we can calculate the total vertical shear, this is S squared here, um, of those made of those two components for the different conditions, and we can see that it's reduced compared to the other times during El Nino and increased compared to the other times during La Nina. And the other part that's important, I said already, is in mixing, um, in mixing parameterizations is not only the shear, but also the stability. And that's the broad by cell frequency n squared, which I'm plotting here. And you can see that the stability is up here. It's somewhat changed, so it's somewhat enhanced. Um, further up in the column, but generally the difference is not very big uh, that during the different conditions. So now why are these shear and stability important? That's because our mixing scheme and a lot of mixing schemes are dependent on the Richardson number, which is the ratio between the shear and the stability. And so I'm plotting the bulk Richardson number, well, I should say gradient, which is the gradient Richardson number um, for the different conditions and, well, let me start here. So normally the critical Richardson number where we start having turbulence is when it goes below 0 0.25. That's this line here. In the model, in this model and this parameterization, the critical Richardson number is not 0 0.25 because otherwise we would have no turbulence. We can see that the model hardly ever inhabits the space. Um, the critical Richardson number is 0 0.7 in effect. So I plotted this here for what it usually is in the real world. This is what counts for the model. And you can see that during La Nina, we have lower Richardson numbers definitely than during El Nino um, and sort of comparable in, when it comes to regime um, as the neutral conditions. And especially during La Nina, what's important is that we have these lower Richardson numbers further, further down in the column. So this is what enables turbulence to happen further down in the column, which enhances the, well, which is reflected in the diffusivity, which then drives um, cross isothermal velocity. And so we can now draw the conclusion that the shear driven part of the vertical mixing is what modulates or influences the cross isothermal velocities and the uh, water mass transformation on ENSO timescales. Okay, so this is for ENSO. Now we can think about other timescales. And the first other timescale that came to my mind was seasonal timescales. So we are returning to minus uh, seven south to seven north maps of cross isothermal velocity. And this is not across a single isotherm, this is across and this is the mean across the 20 to 20 degree, uh, 23 degree isotherm, because I wanna make sure that I'm not only looking at one isotherm that would be moving because the isotherms are moving with the seasonal cycle. So what we see is um, strong cross isothermal velocities during June, July, August, and very much reduced iso cross isothermal velocities during March, April, May. Um, so there is a modulation of cross isothermal velocities with time with seasonal timescales. And the first thing that we would probably think is, well, yeah, okay. So it's also, again, the shear, like we would think it's exactly the same mechanism. I will say I haven't looked into this in too much detail yet. This is an ongoing study. 
But the one thing that I can show you is that, okay, I should, I should point this out for you first. So this is March, April, May is the season where we have low cross thermal velocities, right? And now I'm showing you the seasonal cycle of temperature structure and the EUC, which is mostly um, important for driving this shear, the vertical shear and changing the shear. So you would expect if it's the same story as the shear modulation during ENSO, low shear in March, April, May, when we have low cross thermal velocity. But in fact, if you look at the white contours, which are the EUC, um, and in the letters are in a centimeter per seconds, the velocities, in March, April, May, we have this contour that has 120 centimeters per second, which is absent in all the other times. So the EUC is actually really strong during this time of the year, but still there's low cross thermal velocity. So there's more here that needs to be explored. And then closely tied in with the seasonal cycle and the ENSO um, timescales is something that we've seen in the very first slide where I pointed out these filaments, these wave life structures traveling from the east to the west, and those are tropical instability waves. So I'm showing you in Hofmüller here of 80 degrees west to this should be 160 <laughs> east um, from, from the beginning of 2010 to the end of 2010. I just chose this as a sample year. And what you can see here is that starting in May or June, starting in June, you get these structures that are traveling as they travel in time, travel to the west. So this, this I'm talking about these lines, and those are the tropical instability waves that are that are that you can see um, in the form of colder waters traveling from the east to the west. And now, if I look at an equivalent picture of again the average of cross isothermal velocity between 20 and 23 degrees Celsius, you can see that like when we're getting to the colder times and when we're having these structures, we also have enhanced cross isothermal velocity. And I drew these arrows in here, but it's not really all that obvious, is it, that it's exactly the same structure. So we can now break, so they seem to have an influence, but it's not entirely clear exactly what the influence is. And so we can now again decompose the cross isothermal velocity into the vertical mixing component and the eddy component um, and sort of imagine to see these streaks here. And I will say that this is um, on the equator where the tropical instability waves are not the most clear or the strongest. They're mostly um, clear north of the equator. Um, and what's interesting is that, so before I never even showed you this eddy term because with the solar penetration and the vertical mixing, I was able to almost completely recover the signal in the mean and during ENSO timescales. But now there is a significant on the same order of magnitude contribution of the eddy term to these cross thermal velocities and to the water mass transformation. So this is something that I'm currently looking into and still trying to understand exactly how that happens. And just as a little encouragement that this might be linked to tropical instability waves, is, as I've said, this is along the equator. And if we now move to two north, I think it's quite where we can see tropical instability waves more clearly, it's becoming quite clear that these structures actually are correlated with these tropical instability wave like features. So um, there's definitely more work to be done there. And now just to bring us all back after all these results, I wanna talk just quickly about why does it matter? So it matters because water mass transformation means that water in my case changes the temperature. When water mass transformation happens and tem temperature changes, this is a diabetic process, which means, which means that there's external energy input required, which in this case is provided by um, the solar penetration and vertical mixing provided by the shear. When the in so the vertical mixing results in a heat flux and a heat flux takes heat out of the atmosphere. So this external energy that we are taking is coming from the atmosphere and enables the ocean to absorb heat into the, into the ocean, which is then trans, uh, transported throughout the ocean and, and um, helps supply the ocean circulation with buoyancy and drives the ocean circulation. So it's a measure for when and where the ocean takes up heat and when that happens, how that happens and, and exactly where does it happen. And that's why it's important to study these processes so we understand the the circulation of the ocean. 
So with that, I'll just leave you with my summary slide, which uh, says that I have shown you that cross acceleration velocity has a modulation with ENSO. Uh, during La Nina, we have very strong water mass transformation, very strong uptake of heat. And during El Nino, we have very little water mass transformation. This modulation is controlled by the diffusivity kappa, which in turn is controlled by the vertical shear. And my next steps, I, uh, in my next steps, I will try to untangle the details of the seasonal cycle and the tropical instability waves and look at eddy effects across time and length scales. And I would like to thank you for attending this presentation. Should I stop sharing or I'll just leave it up for a second? Uh, leave it up, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got some questions. Unless awesome. anyone wants to go first. No, nope. okay. I've got two questions. Um, the first one is going back to the figure that you showed where you, uh, close to the start, where you had the lines of the upwelling velocity. Okay, let me yeah. see if I can manage to, oh, see, I already did something weird. Um, Lines upwelling velocity. Yeah, this one? so with the one with the error bars on. Oh, error bar. Ah, oh, this one. Yeah. So, are these these lines? Are they from observations? Yeah. So these are observational okay. estimates. So yeah. one problem is that I mean, obviously, we have vertical velocity from the model, so we could diagnose it directly. But vertical velocity is at this moment very poorly constrained. So, because we only have so few observations and it's so hard to measure it. Basically, you can't measure it directly because the speeds are so low compared to the zonal and marginal velocities. And um, we have only a few estimates. And if it's poorly constrained, I, wouldn't, I would be a little careful jumping on it and using the model vertical velocity and saying, this is the truth. So we need to, um, we need to have more guidance and hopefully there will be more guidance. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, I think there's, proposals being prepared about observing this better to constrain this better. Um, yeah, so this, okay. these are the observational estimates we have. And so just from remembering from your figures, it seems like the magnitude of the modeled velocity that you get matches quite well to this. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, it matches really well. And actually, so there is one estimate of cross external velocity um, from and one paper that I haven't shown. And that's this one. Um, so the magnitude of the vertical velocity matches quite well. And also this one paper from Christopher Mayen et al. in 2001 actually estimates the cross experiment velocity. And that also the magnitude matches quite well. I mean, they again get this negative mm -hmm. velocities down here, which we don't see. We don't see them in the vertical, uh, in the Eulerian field, nor do we see them in the cross experiment fields. Um, but yeah, in general, the model at least it doesn't seem like it's worlds off from the real world. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, and my second question, just while I've got you. So you um, looked at the mean, then you looked at the seasonal cycle and the tropical instability waves. And for the tropical instability waves, you have suspect it might be to do with that eddy term. For the seasonal cycle, you said that you weren't, you don't think it's to do with the shear. And I know that this you're still working on on this, but do you have a working hypothesis for what that could be? I really don't. Okay, All right. <laughs> I really, I no, I really don't. Because, <laughs> I mean, it could be. Um, it's not only the shear is not the only thing. Uh, it's also the the temperature gradient that I haven't looked at because okay. all these cross isothermal velocities are calculated um, using the magnitude of the temperature gradient. So that's another term that could shift things the other way and I would have to have a look at that but okay so maybe that's as close as I am to working hypothesis okay that sounds like a pretty good working hypothesis <laughs> thanks. thanks Anna yeah do we have any further questions from our local audience in Miami <laughs> Until then. Okay, I don't see any. So I guess that's all for today. So thank you very much, Annalena, for giving a nice talk for us.
Thank you, Thank you. Kathy for inviting Annalena and helping us with the introduction. Um, this is the only seminar this week. We didn't find anybody for Friday. And next Wednesday will be a wellness Wednesday of the university where we shouldn't have any activities of that kind. But next Friday, we will have another speaker from Colorado, uh, who, who is now at Rasmus in some way, Isabel McCoy. So I will announce it soon. I haven't received the abstract so far, but uh, stay tuned, watch the emails. There will be an interesting seminar next Friday, next week. So thank you, have a good afternoon and goodbye. Thanks, Anna.